I suppose that most all of us have had the occasion to have to call in sick for work. Hopefully, you've had a really, really good reason to do that. A lot of people do not. Uh, in fact, um, I ran across an article that originally came out on Career Builder, and uh, the article lists the 20 worst excuses for calling in sick. I thought they were, well, unusual <laughs> at first and uh, kind of funny as well. Can I, can I share a few of these with you? Just so you make sure, if you're going to call in sick, you don't use one of these because your boss already has this list. Number one, I was sprayed by a skunk. If you were, please don't go to work. I'm, I'm <laughs> but but that that would be very unusual. In fact, I haven't seen a skunk since I moved from West Virginia to North Carolina, and I don't know what that says about West Virginia, but we had them all over the place up there. Here's another one. My bus broke down and we were held up by robbers. I guess that's somebody who was riding a bus to work. I was arrested as a result of a mistaken identity. That's creative. I forgot to come back to work after lunch. I don't think that one would fly. I couldn't find my shoes. Well, I can identify with that. Uh, I totaled my wife's Jeep in a collision with a cow. A hitman was looking for me. <laughs> my curlers burned my hair and I had to go to the hairdresser. I eloped. And I love this one. My brain went to sleep and I couldn't wake it up. <laughs> I can believe that one for some folks. Uh, even myself once in a while. My cat unplugged the alarm again. I had to attend my husband's grand jury trial. I had to ship my mother's bones to India. That wouldn't have been so bad, but he also included this note. She passed away 20 years ago. I forgot what day of the week it was. A tree fell on my car, and I love this one. This has got to be the, the classic one. My monkey died. <laughs> Believe me, you don't want to ever have a monkey as a pet. My brother tried that one time, and it was... An utter disaster. Well, anyway, we're really good at making excuses. Some people are good at making an excuse when there is no excuse, obviously. Um, we're not so far removed from the days of Moses. They were excuse makers, too. Uh, if you remember, Moses went up onto the mountain, was gone for 40 days and 40 nights. And the people said, well, you know, Aaron... You need to, to build us uh, an idol. You need to fashion us uh, something to worship. Because Moses is gone, and we don't know when, he for, when he'll ever come back, or if he will. That was their excuse for doing the very thing that they had already been told not to do, worship an idol. And then Aaron uh, has an excuse too when Moses comes back. Moses basically says, Aaron, what were you thinking? Why did you do this? And Aaron said, well, you know, the people pressed me. The people insisted. The people, you know, uh, made me do it. So this was a people, even in Moses' day, that liked to make excuses. But what we see in chapter 33 of Exodus and chapter 34 is a people that have had all their excuses stripped away. God's judgment has already fell on many of them. In chapter 33, we see that that sin has affected the nation. That, that sin, even though God's initial judgment has fallen, has still affects their journey and their relationship with God. And they realize, the nation seems to realize what they had done and where they were at with their relationship with the Lord. Now, they were used to 
the presence of the Lord being very, very real in, uh, in the sense that they could see God's presence. They were led through the wilderness by the cloud during the day and by night by the, the pillar of fire. But there's a, there's a change now that comes about. God is still with them and he's going to be present with them, but things are going to be done a little differently as an indication to them of their failure, of a constant reminder to them of what had happened. And this is all what we see as we begin chapter 33. And so we are talking about, in this chapter, God's presence. They had to pick up the pieces, if you will, of their sin. And so from that we learn some things ourselves about how we can pick up the pieces of our life when we disobey God. Now, in this dispensation... God's presence does not go from us when we sin. We are permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit that indwells us can be very unhappy with us. That relationship, which is very, very close and and, and personal, can be disrupted. In fact, the Scripture teaches us we can grieve the Holy Spirit that lives within us. Ephesians 4.30 We can make Him very sad and He can become very unhappy with us. And unless we confess our sins and straighten things out, we may even endure the discipline of God. So as we come to chapter 33, we're talking about picking up the pieces when we have disobeyed God. Now, there are three aspects of picking up the pieces I want you to notice, and they all have to do with coming back to God in an attitude of dependence upon God. Uh, in a contrite attitude, with a different attitude than we had when we so uh, much disobeyed and failed Him. So let's look at these three aspects now of our dependence. God's presence requires dependence. That's what we're going to learn. If God is going to be present in our lives in the most powerful way, in the most effective way, uh, in a way in which He is happy and joyful, and uh, He is working in our life and not having to discipline us, then that means we've got to constantly be dependent upon Him and realize that we need Him in order to function and live and serve the God as we were created to do. So, what are some aspects of this Attitude of dependence. Number one, confession has to be made when we sin. That's pretty much a given. Any of us could have filled in point one. We have to confess our sins. Look, if you will, in chapter 33, at verse 4. When the people heard this bad news. Now, what bad news had they heard? Well, they had heard from God. When the people heard this bad news, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. Now, let's just go back for a moment and see why this occurred. The Lord said to Moses, verse 1, Depart and go up from here, you and the people uh, whom you have brought out of the land of Egypt. And then in verse 2 he says, And I will send my angel before you. I will send my angel, my messenger, before you. Literally, the angel of the Lord. I will send him before you, and I'll drive out. And he mentions those peoples there in Canaan, he'll drive out. And so he says in verse 3, Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And this is what made them, in verse 4, mourn. It says, And the people heard this bad news and mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. Now, that sounds a little strange put on the ornaments they did they didn't put on their jewelry they didn't they didn't uh, put on those things that they were used to putting on now they got this from egypt the people in egypt would wear jewelry of all sorts around their neck and on their arms on their fingers and and so on and much of that wealth from egypt had been given to them when they departed and and they were used to wearing it and maybe hadn't had that opportunity before so they were kind of enamored with it and it uh, demonstrated they were somebody in their eyes and in their mind and and yet now having failed God the God who had led them out of Egypt and given them this freedom and given them this wealth to show their 
their remorse, if you will, to show their uh, repentance, they remove their jewelry. Now, this was men and women both, as the practice was in those days. It is not all that uncommon, I guess, even in our day, uh, for men to wear jewelry, especially baseball players. I mean, we're watching the playoffs right now. You ever notice how many of them got something hanging around their neck or whatever? It's not unusual. Maybe a little different from uh, male to female, but uh, they removed them. In their mourning, verse 5, And the Lord said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. Now, stiff-necked referred to an animal, and you can compare it to a horse, if you will, who has a bridle and a rein, and you try to steer that horse in one direction, and the horse is rebelling and, and, and stiffening his neck and, and is not willing to go in that direction. So that's the picture we have of Israel's rebellious attitude here, and God uses it throughout the book of Exodus, calling them stiff-necked. He said, I could come up, I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now therefore take off your ornaments that you, that I may know that uh, what you, that I may know what to do to you. So the taking off of their ornaments in verse four was probably not done until God told them to do it, but they did do it. And that is uh, mentioned now twice. Verse 6 is mentioned again. So the children of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments by Mount Horeb. So this demonstrated outwardly that they had uh, come to be aware of their sin and that they were mourning over their sin. It was an outward demonstration of their confession of sin. Now, some were judged uh, very severely, as we uh, learned before, and uh, were most responsible, but the whole nation stood back and let this this whole thing with the golden calf transpire and did nothing about it. So uh, in a very real sense, they were all guilty, even if they may not have been the ones, uh, you know, dancing there in front of the idol uh, when Moses returned. So uh, now they come under conviction, and they express their conviction visually, their confession uh, to the Lord. Now, we have a tendency to cover up our sin or to excuse ourselves in some way or we're yet to justify what we do wrong in our own eyes rather than simply admit we have sinned. You say, well, I don't know if I do that. Like, yes, you do. I got, there's not a one of you fellas whose wife doesn't get on him who doesn't make an excuse for your actions, right? I see that guilty look. It's all over your face. That's the first thing I do. My wife says I did something wrong. Well, 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 I, you know, here's why. And this is I did. And I, did. I, I suppose you ladies might do that once in a while yourselves. It's a tendency of mankind. It goes all the way back to Adam when uh, the Lord uh, spoke to Adam about his sin and he said, well, it was, you know, it was the woman's fault. So we're good at shifting the blame. We're good at making excuses. We're good at covering things up. And unfortunately, we're not very good at just confessing, admitting when we have done wrong. Uh, I like what D.L. Moody said many years ago. He said, unconfessed sin is unforgiven sin. And unforgiven sin is the darkest, foulest thing on this sin-cursed earth. Now, that's a pretty strong statement, but I think he's pretty much right on. Now, we're talking here in terms of us as Christians confessing our sin. Our sin is not going to remove our salvation. We have been uh, given eternal life that's grace. That's something we didn't earn in any way. And is given to us on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ who died and paid the price already for it. But our relationship with God is certainly affected by our sin. We can grieve that Holy Spirit that lives within us. God can be unhappy with us. He got, he, God can have to work in our lives for the purpose of getting us straightened out. And that recalls for the confession of sin. If you do not already have 1 John 1, 9 you memorized, you should jot down 1 John 1, 9 and memorize it now. If we confess our sin, 
He, meaning God, is faithful, he'll always do it, and just, he's just because Christ died for us, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what he does in regard to our personal day-by-day relationship to him as our God. Now, if we don't confess that sin, it's not forgiven. Now, that sin is forgiven as far as our eternal punishment is concerned already, but it's not forgiven in terms of that right relationship, that joyful relationship, that, that wonderful relationship that we enjoy with Him when we do not have unconfessed sin in our life. And I think that's what Moody is talking about here as much as anything else. Uh, you might also want to just for... Uh, Purposes of looking at later, jot down the book of James, uh, James chapter 4 and verse 8. James 4, 8 and following, James says this. He says, draw near to God. Now he's talking about when you have sinned, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. How do you do that? You can't do it yourself, but you cleanse your hands by coming to him in confession. 1 John 1, 9. Cleanse your hands, therefore he says, uh, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. That's what confession of sin is all about. And James makes a, a very good statement in that regard there. James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. But sin needs to be, if it is truly confessed, it needs to be confirmed. Well, if, if your, if your sin is not confirmed by your putting it away and ceasing to repeat it, then you haven't really confessed it. Now, I understand. You and I have certain things in our life, and the truth of the matter is, we have certain weaknesses morally and spiritually, and, and we tend to repeat the same sins, hopefully not that often, but sometimes quite often. And God is faithful. He will always forgive us when we come and confess to Him. But we, that confession has to be made in the sense that we renounce that that we were doing and have done, and that we don't intend to do it again, and we understand it is wrong, and uh, we, we turn from it. So if we don't have that attitude, it's not really confession. Now, we will be weak uh, from time to time and repeat sins. But we don't want to be in a position where we think, well, okay, you, you, got, you know, God, I don't, you know, I take it lightly. And, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, Lord, I sin, but then we intend to do the same thing again tomorrow. That's not, that's not a real confession. And so we see this in uh, chapter 33, verse 5 here. He says, For the Lord said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do to you. So the Lord says, Give me some confirmation. Show me something in your life that you're, you're, that you're sincere in your remorse and in your confession. So uh, that's a very important aspect of this whole thing. That's number one. The first aspect, first aspect of our dependence or acknowledgement of the need to depend on Him, to have the proper relationship, confession when we sin. But then number two is compliance with the Word. Compliance with the word. I mean, if we have sinned, we have violated God's word. We have violated God's will. We have rebelled against God. So to really then show our confession, or if our confession, maybe put it this way, if our confession is really true, then we will need to see it confirmed in our life, not only by outward things like took off my jewelry. We wouldn't do it that way today. That's something God asked them to do. Uh, but sometimes, even Christians need to confess their sin publicly if it's been a sin against the, the body. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a private matter between two people, then it should stay private. Uh, 
there are outward expressions of confession, but the real ultimate purpose of confession and cleansing is that we might become obedient again, that we might once again come into compliance with the Word of God. Now, where do we see that? Let's go back to verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, Depart and go up from here. Now, what does he mean by that? Remember, they are at the extreme southern end of the Arabian Peninsula. You know, way down there on Mount Sinai, they have traveled east, but mostly south, mostly due south from the time they crossed the Red Sea until they come down to that little point down there uh, at the end of the peninsula. So when God says go up, he means go back up, if you will, go north to the promised land. That's the only place they can go. They can't go back, obviously. They can't go south. Uh, there's nothing but water there. They, they, they need to go north. In fact, there's water to the west where they're at at the moment. So they need to go north to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey, the land God promised to Abraham and the land that he is sending them to uh, occupy. So uh, he basically says, go ahead and do what you've been called to do. Go ahead and fulfill the purpose why you're here and how why I led you out. And, uh, you know, you, you, you yourselves have stymied your progress. You yourselves have rebelled against me. Now, <clears throat> here's what you need to do now that you understand you've sinned. Get back to doing what you're out here to do. <clears throat> Get back to that point of obedience where you're following me and following my leadership and doing what I called you to do and why I have brought you to this place. Now, <clears throat> I like what Vance Havner said many years ago. I think it's still true today. He says, we have not really learned a commandment until we have obeyed it. It goes on to explain. The church, he said, suffers today. This has been many years ago, back in the early 1900s, I think. The church suffers today from Christians who know volumes more than they practice. Well, that's probably very true uh, of the church here in 2019. We need to obey. We need to, you know, it's not that we don't know what to do. It's, you know, our problem as Christians is not that we are ill-informed or untaught. I mean, we have the Word of God to read ourselves. We've heard the preaching of it and the teaching of it. We have all sorts of opportunities to partake of the Word of God and feed on the Word of God. Our problem is not that we're ignorant. The problem is that we're rebellious. The problem is we violate our conscience. That's the problem. Now, because we do violate our conscience, then that's something we need to seriously deal with by confessing that and complying again with the Word of God. It is so, it is so easy for us to see everybody else's sin. Jesus said, you know, you can see the log in your brother's eye. I mean, you can see the speck in your brother's eye. It's that, it's that log in your own eye that you can't see. That is so true. And sometimes it takes somebody else pointing out that log before we're honest enough with ourselves. But it's amazing, it's amazing what we can accept, cover up, excuse, and uh, tolerate, and still think, well, we're all right as long as nobody knows. But God knows, and that, that relationship, that day-by-day -day, uh, relationship with our Heavenly Father, uh, His full and joyful presence is just not there in our life on a daily basis. Here's a very interesting thing. This happened a long time ago, too, uh, way back uh, 100 plus years ago. It was a, an American Baptist scholar by the name of A.T. Robertson. I, I still refer to his uh, volumes uh, quite often when I'm looking at the, the New Testament Greek. He, he taught Greek for years in a seminary in Louisville. While he was there as a professor, he was asked to write an article or maybe I think it was a series of articles, on different books of the New Testament. Well, he came to the book of 3 John. Now, 3 John deals with a man in the church there that he is writing to whose name was Diotrephes. And the problem was is that Diotrephes 
had become the church boss. He had become a tyrant, if you will. He became, had become a dictator in the church and uh, probably wasn't even qualified to be leading, but uh, he, was, he was your typical church boss, and too many churches have him. And so A.T. Robertson wrote an article about Diotrephes and, and why he was wrong and his sins and the whole thing. And he didn't think anything about it. A few weird years went by, and Robertson tells his story. He said, 40 years ago, this is what he, he writes in his volume, uh, one of his volumes, Word Pictures of the New Testament. He said, 40 years ago, I wrote an article on diatrophies for a denominational paper. The editor told me that as a response, 25 deacons stopped receiving the paper and wrote to, to him the reason was because they had been personally attacked. That's, that's a real, that's a problem in your heart, isn't it? That, that, that's a, that's guilt. He didn't personally attack anybody. He didn't call anybody by name, but they stopped their subscription because A.T. Robertson had personally attacked him. No, the Spirit of God had personally attacked them. That's what happened. But you see, they, they shut themselves off from that. They had shut that down. They didn't, they didn't recognize that. They, they had really literally began to sear their conscience. As Timothy wrote, we don't want to get to that position and that circumstance in our life. Well, in addition to this matter of getting back onto the journey, chapter 34 gives us all kinds of things that are a reiteration of what he has already said to the people in the law. And so if you read from chapter 34... Uh, beginning uh, at about verse 29, you will see, nah, that's the wrong place, uh, chapter 34, beginning at about verse 12, and you read down through a number of verses, you see all these things mentioned that they are supposed to do, and there are things that they are already told to do and instructed to do and knew to do. Uh, so there's commandments to observe the different feasts and to uh, observe the certain sacrifices and uh, to not uh, marry uh, outside of their nation when they get into the land and to destroy all the idols in the land when they get there. And, and it just goes on and on and on in this list. So once again, we see there how God expects us to comply with the Word of God. If we really are dependent upon Him, if we're really in a right relationship, then that's what we'll do. Then number three, the third aspect of truly being dependent upon God and understanding the importance of that that face-to-face -face relationship we have with Him in our soul through the Holy Spirit is that we've got to be concerned about that. We've got to be concerned about God's presence in our life. Not, not whether He's there, not whether the Holy Spirit indwells us, that we know. Romans 8 9 says, if you have not the Spirit of God, you're none of His. So if you're saved, you have the Spirit of God. <coughs> Romans 8 9. But the Spirit of God can literally be rendered uh, inoperative if you refuse to listen. We mentioned Ephesians 4.30 that says you can grieve the Spirit of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19 says we can quench the Spirit. <clears throat> now, to quench the Spirit, I mean, just, just think of a campfire and you, you pour a bucket of water on it. The fire is put out. So the Spirit of God doesn't leave. We are we secure in our relationship in that regard. But we can literally, when the Spirit of God uh, flames up in us to motivate us and to deal with us and to strengthen us and to change us, uh, we can literally throw a bucket of cold water on Him and not listen. And if we do that often enough, we get to the point where the Holy Spirit is grieved with our life, grieved with our decisions, grieved with the way we live and, and, and our disobedience and our rebellion. So we have to become concerned about God's presence. Now, Moses is a great example. We want to go back to chapter 33, verse 11. And look what goes on here as far as Moses is concerned. 
Verse 7 says he took the tent and pitched it outside the camp. Now, <laughs> that's not the tent in, in regard to uh, being the tabernacle, who's, uh, the tabernacle has not been built or constructed yet. This is probably a temporary place of worship, uh, rather than the finished tabernacle with the priesthood in operation. And he pitched it outside the camp. Again, a picture to the Israelites that God wasn't as close to them as he had been until he sees some change in their life, until he sees some true confession. And uh, he called it the tabernacle of meeting, and it came to pass that everyone who sought the Lord went to the tabernacle of meeting, which was outside the camp. So it was whenever Moses went out to the tabernacle that all the people rose, and each man stood at his tent door and watched Moses until he had gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass when Moses entered the tabernacle that the pillar of cloud descended, and sit at the door of the tabernacle, and the Lord talked with Moses. And the point here is, God had just as close an intimate relationship with Moses as he had ever had, but there is a strained relationship between God and the rest of the people. And yet the people begin to realize that and see that in a very real way with the tent of the meeting outside the camp, and yet Moses has this continual uh, personal relationship with God. All the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the tabernacle door and all the people rose and worshipped each man at his tent door. So it has an effect on them. Their, their confession of sin and now be, is beginning to become compliance with the word and they're beginning to become concerned about their own relationship to God and we see it as they worship. Verse 11. So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as he, as a man speaks to his friend. Now, down in verse 12, Moses then, in his speaking and communicating with God, has some requests. And Moses said to the Lord, verse 12, See you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way that I may know you and that I may find grace in your sight and consider that this nation is your people. And he, this is God speaking, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now that's probably a reference to the fact that he'd already said, I'll send my angel, the angel of the Lord with you. And Moses is saying, I, you know, I want a closer relationship than that. I want to, I want a daily conversation. I want to know you intimately. So Moses says this in verse 15, then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. This is how concerned Moses is with the continual presence of the Lord. He continues in verse 16, for how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, verse 17, I will also do this thing that you have spoken, for you have found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. So he's going to give Moses a personal aspect of continuing, of a continuing relationship. The people are only going to have the leadership of the angel of the Lord. In response to this in verse 18, Moses said, Please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. This is God. He says to Moses, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And the Lord continues to speak and said, You cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me. Here is a place by me, and you shall stand on the rock. So God said, Moses, I want you to go and stand on this particular rock. So it shall be, while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand as I pass by. You remember that from the song. What's the name of that song? What it? Rock of Ages. My mind went blank there for a minute. The Rock of Ages, we've all sung that. It comes right from this verse. Then the Lord says, um, 
So shall it be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock and will cover you with my hand while I pass by. Then I will take away my hand, so you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. My friends, I suggest to you that not literally, but in a very real sense, we have seen his face that Moses couldn't see. The Lord Jesus Christ. We weren't there to look at Jesus' face literally, but we know him. We know him through the spirit that indwells us in a much greater way than this miraculous experience that Moses had with his literal uh, sight. But yet we become so unconcerned about the presence of God in our life. From time to time we just grow, I don't know, we just get to the point where we just take God for granted. We take God for granted so we don't worship Him. We take God for granted so we don't pray. We take God for granted so uh, we don't read His Word. We take God for granted so we're not growing and we're not becoming Christ-like. And, and yeah, we're a Christian, but I'm just going through the motions. It's like I'm walking around uh, in a daze. It's our fault. There's no excuse for that. God's presence... God's presence is important. We ought to be concerned about it. I want to leave you with a little illustration, and I don't entirely know how to describe it or what to make of it, but this comes from way back in colonial days. The first American missionary, Adniram Judson, went to Burma. He reportedly came home at some point. It must have been late in in his ministry because he was there for many years without coming home. And he came to Stonington, Connecticut. And there was a young boy playing about the wharves at the time of Judson's arrival as his ship came in. And this young boy was struck by Judson's appearance. Never before had he seen such a light as he described it on a human face. He immediately ran up the street to a minister he knew to ask if he knew who the stranger was. The minister hurried back to meet Judson, forgot about the little boy, Spent his time conversing with Judson Judson and so on. Many years afterward, according to the story, many years afterward, that boy, who could never get away from the influence of that wonderful face, became the famous preacher, Henry Clay Trumbull. In a book of his memoirs, he penned a chapter entitled, What a Boy Saw in the Face of Adoniram Judson. Now, I suggest to you that Adoniram Judson had such a power without saying a word because he had suffered so much. You can't read his life and story of his work in Burma, the, the terrible suffering he went through, he and his family. And it's when you suffer, you need God. And it's when you suffer, you call on God. And you you beg for God's blessing and God's presence and God's comfort and God's strength. And you come to a point in your life, all of us do, through suffering, where we are better acquainted with our God and more dependent upon Him. And Judson had been to that point in his life, and it was noticeable, noticeable somehow. Just an unexplainable thing. So I would end with these two questions for us this morning. How how concerned are you about your relationship, your day-to-day relationship with God? How concerned are you about that? Concerned enough to pray, to speak to Him, to talk to Him, to read His Word, to worship Him, to serve Him? How concerned are you with that relationship? And a second question, how concerned... Are we about grieving the Holy Spirit that permanently indwells our soul? If He indwells us, if He he lives within us, He knows every thought. He knows every 
word. He knows every intention of our heart and that he knows all the wickedness that dwells within us. And yet we are so often unconcerned about it all. We should be. 